Hello, welcome. Uh, we're just getting everything started here and letting everybody gather. I'm glad you're here. I figured I'd do a little talking so you can test your audio. Uh, we will be getting started here in just a moment. Oh, and I'm testing all my pieces. I'm we're live streaming this to YouTube, so that was a good reminder that I need to make sure the volume on my uh, the machine that I'm, I'm monitoring that is not turned is, is turned down, so we don't get an echo. So I'm going to turn off my monitor, my uh, video, and uh, my mic again here uh, for a couple more minutes. But I just wanted to thank everybody who's here early. Thanks for getting here uh, and claiming your spot. And we'll be starting here shortly. All right, I figured I would just come and hang out with folks as uh, we wait for this to start. Feel free to use the chat if you'd like to say hello, good evening. Uh, I have talked to Ron already and he's uh, gonna be sharing his camera. We'll, we'll turn off the uh, this event uh, display, which is talking about what we're gonna learn tonight here in just a few minutes. So there's Ron, welcome Ron, hey. Unmute there. We still got plenty of time where people are just gathering. So I just was sitting here and it was getting awful quiet. So I figured who, uh, you know, I guess I get, maybe perhaps I like to hear the sound of my voice. I had to fill the sound or something. So I'll try and keep my introductory remarks here at seven o'clock short so we can get into the heart of the matter. I'm excited. I actually had a chance uh, to deploy some of what we uh, covered last week, uh, last night, which was fun. Uh, maybe I should save it for the official class, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Ron. I was, we were out looking at the comet, uh, or trying to see the comet, and uh, I was playing with a light mode, uh, and, or, and with just taking some night photography, and I got a couple of cool shots. I was pretty surprised. It was pretty neat.
For anybody who's watching the clock, we'll be starting in just about four minutes. So I'll speak every couple of times just so that you know your audio is working. If you can see my lips, or maybe I'll put a, a message out there because if you see my lips and you can't hear anything, uh, that's because I have unmuted myself. Um, so I'll keep talking uh, for a moment just so that I can send a chat to everybody. Um, make sure that your audio is working. So I'll say hi, everyone. Uh, rather than babbling and filling your space with my voice, I will just speak occasionally so that you can know that your audio is working. But uh, I'll make sure I give enough of an introduction so that if you really need to tweak your audio settings, you'll have a little bit of time to do that here in just a couple minutes. The hour is getting near. We'll be starting here in, in just under a minute. I'm getting very close. Thank you, everybody, for your patience as we let people gather. All right, normally I give a little bit of time for folks to find their way in when we're meeting uh, in person, but I'm gonna go ahead and start talking because it's seven o'clock and uh, you all are in here. So let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Uh, I'll go ahead and take over this and I will make myself a spotlight video. Um, we are recording this as you, I'm sure were notified as you joined the room. We're also live streaming to YouTube right now. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Clayton Cheever. I am the Assistant Director of the Thomas Crane Public Library, uh, which I'm representing behind me. Um, I did have a collared shirt uh, hidden behind me so I could be a little more formal for this evening's event, but I hope you'll all forgive me in these hot days. I, it was just too much for me to put it on, so I, I left the t-shirt on. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. 
I am not joining you from the glorious uh, library. I am actually at home, as I trust you're all safe and sound wherever you are joining us from, uh, most likely in your homes. Um, but if you're out and about, please just stay safe. Um, you're welcome to use your audio, uh, I mean, to use your video. We are, um, everybody is going to be muted except for Ron and I during this call. We will be using the chat uh, for any questions. And we've had experiences, we got Zoom bombed once. Uh, so we learned our lesson there and we make it so that the chat is only uh, so that you can communicate with me and ask questions. Um, you can have a more public chat if you'd like on YouTube where there's some more, um, you know, they just seem to have a little more control and be able to take care of bots. We've been fighting bots occasionally, so hopefully that won't be the case tonight. Uh, I'm not concerned. We had a great class last week. If you missed it, you can go and check it out on YouTube. Um, we're working on some post-production to make it even uh, cleaner and spiffier with some stuff at the beginning and the end, but the heart of the content is all right there right now. So you can go enjoy it um, and then be all ready uh, to jump in. You didn't need to participate last week. If you missed it, that's totally fine. Uh, tonight's class will stand on its own. If you need to leave early, we're gonna be recording this as I already mentioned. So you can go and watch it later, share it with your friends uh, and encourage everybody to come and join us next week. Um, so you can continue enjoying Ron's classes. We have a number of other programs happening here at the library that I wanna tell you about. Um, the very next one ha happening is happening on Thursday evening. So come back and join us again here on Zoom. It's a different meeting address. So you'll just need to go to the calendar to find that address or find us simply on YouTube or on Facebook. Um, that event is going to be is uh, a series we've been doing. We've done uh, a number of them already. It's called Cooking with Colin. Uh, we're co-sponsoring them or are partnering with the Boston Vegetarian Society um, to present these programs with a vegan chef who has taught classes all over the Massachusetts. Uh, and he's actually branching beyond this as well uh, because he recently moved up to Portland, Maine. Um, he also happens to be a friend of mine, which is, uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to be able to work with friends. Uh, frankly, we've become friends with the people who are doing these programs already. So it's great. Um, let's see, we have lots of people who are coming in as I'm speaking, which is why I stretch this out a little bit to let everybody get comfortable. Um, but that program, Cooking with Colin, is happening Thursday at 7 o'clock, and the topic this week is all about cooking veggie burgers and sausages. So it's very easy to throw a burger on the grill, but a lot of people have a challenge when they're looking to make their own veggie burger and not just pull something out of a box. So Colin will be how to uh, use healthy ingredients to make a burger that everybody can enjoy, uh, your carnivores and your vegetarians, everybody in your group. Um, so, uh, and he's got a sausage as well, uh, a, a vegetarian sausage. So if you're curious how that's done, I encourage you to come and find out how it's made Thursday at seven. Uh, these programs are, including tonight's program, are made possible by the fabulous friends of the Thomas Crane Public Library. Um, I did get a request if I could speak a little louder, so I will work on projecting, um, which is a good tip. And I know we had some challenges with people hearing me last week as well, so it could be background noise or my situation. I know if you're having any problems hearing me right now um, that there were some challenges last week and that when Ron started, everything went away. So I just need to stop talking and get out of the way. So let me finish saying thank you to the friends and I'll stop and we'll get this program underway. The friends are fabulous, even though we're closed and they are not able to run our bookstore right now. They still have members that are supporting them and they're supporting us, our ability to do these online programs. Um, so just love the friends. If you're not familiar with the friends, go out to our, our website. I can put a link in the chat. Uh, and you can learn more about them and become a friend yourself. So all of you who are members of the Friends joining us tonight, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. Um, even physically be together these days, uh, we know that we have your support and it's just great to, to be able to share that with the community. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the spotlight and the torch to Ron and just sit in the background and help him with questions and, and uh, any technical issues you have. So thanks, make sure you're comfortable and let's enjoy tonight's program. Ron, I'm passing it to you. Thank you, Clayton. <clears throat> if there are any lingering questions actually from last week, I think I might uh, tonight, as I try to describe and show you that ineffable property of art of whatever composition is and go through some of the, uh, the rules if you were, but take it directly to your iPhone and show you which one of the parts of the application you need to use to achieve these. The, the question of composition and what it is in art, I suppose you'd have to say it's, it's part of it is the displacement of where you put the, 
the elements together in a, in a picture, in a piece of music. Um, people talk about balance, whatever that is. And in the visual arts, I would say composition is a way of guiding the viewer's eye maybe towards the most important elements of your work. But the basic criteria is what, what do you want to do with it? Why take the picture? I mean, that's a very simple question. Uh, why even bother to take a picture? I, excuse me for one minute. I just want to clear my... Very good, that's better. Um, so the, the, I, the goal of, of good composition is to help express whatever the idea is that you're trying to, to achieve. And again, what is an idea? And there are many rules of what some of the ways of achieving this are. But I think also that one of the things that can be done with these cameras now, with these iPhones, is not just why are you taking it, but you wanna record reality. You want to actually take an image of what's going on out there, um, even if it's to take a picture of, 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 of a document. But beyond that, what is the difference between a good photograph and a bad, I shouldn't say a bad photograph, a non-good non photograph? The first thing that I wanna show you that you can do, and this is directly with the camera, and I didn't spend enough time on this last time. I'm going to be using an iPhone, but it's identical on your Android phones. And that is of where you place the focus and the brightness and, and, and the exposure when you go to take a picture. This should be the first thing that you do. And you'll have to give me each time a few minutes to get this set up. I'm going to share my iPhone and that takes a minute. Should be screen mirroring now. And we'll share that. The magic of technology, Ron. This is yep. fabulous. We see your phone. It's great. There it is. And I won't be picking this up and carrying it around with me. So you're not going to be able to see actually uh, anything else but my desk. But I think in this case that, um, that I can show you this. Um, when you turn on your camera, one of the first things that you can do is tap the screen. Just tap the screen and you're going to see either in an Android or on an iPhone, a box. In some of the phones and some of the apps, you'll have a box and a circle. The box can represent the focus um, or it can also represent the exposure. And if you have a box and a circle, take that and you can move that box around. I am going to pick it up because I want to show you in a larger area before, don't get dizzy, um, how that changes. If you want the exposure, for example, here's very highlight. If I press, you see that? My finger there, it's going to give you the best exposure for what's out there in that bright area. If you want to bring out the detail and the actual focus of your attention, the person, the thing that you want to have exposed correctly, you go like that. On the side of this, you'll also notice that there is a little sun, a little sun. You can change that sun and it will change the exposure so that you get the optimum exposure. These, this is very, very useful for taking portraits. Go right up to the subject matter and hit the box. And then if it's not exactly right, you can change the exposure. <clears throat> this is very, very useful in bright sunlight. I'm gonna put this back. It's very useful in bright sunlight because very often 
the subject matter, is when you're taking pictures of kids, of children, it's going to be washed out in the sunlight. This is the way to correct that, is to take that box, and you can also make the box larger, and place it anywhere in there that you want the detail. There's a shadow area. That's what I want to show you. This is a desk. I want to show you the texture there. If you have questions, leave them with Clayton and we will come back to that. So, I'm also going to show you tonight um, a group of photographs. Some of them are going to be my own. Some of them are from tutorials, which are much easier to use. Um, and for you to, um, I'll give you references to it, to try to, to take these examples of what makes up a composition. What are the rules? There are certain rules and everyone says, you know, the cliche is these rules are meant to be broken, but these are established visual rules that will help you take better pictures. The first one that you hear of all the time is the, role, the, the rule of thirds. On your camera, on your I'm going to bring you back now to this to show you the rule of thirds. And we're going to go back and share the screen. And hopefully that will come back. And Ron, um, while you bring that up, uh, yeah. we had a couple of questions about what you were doing it before. So I'm not trying to interrupt your, your, your yeah. train of thought with the rule of thirds, but just let me know when you're ready for a couple of questions. I'm saving right. them until you're ready. Yep. Let me get this back. And I'll do no this problem. quickly. And then we'll take the questions. I did want to show people this. Absolutely. Um, and here we go. You can see the grid right now on my camera. And this breaks your screen up into quote thirds. You can see the thirds, uh, th there are three rows and they're breaking up into different areas. The thirds, the areas that you're supposed to put your subject is up in one of the intersecting spots on your grid. Now, you don't have to do this all the time. I won't get into the psychology of why this works, but that demonstrates the rule of thirds. It's a good idea to turn your grid on anyway, because it's going to help you keep the horizon level. So I suggest that you find where the grid is. I'll show you on an iPhone. I think you'll find it in other places also. And uh, this is the quote rule of thirds. Okay, questions? Yes. There were some questions about, uh, let's see, the most recent question was how to get the grid to show up on an iPhone, on an Android. Um, so I don't know if you know how to do that, if you get to- Yes, um, the problem with my showing you Android is that every single Android manufacturer almost all of them have different have different software. Yeah. So if I show you on a Samsung, I'm not gonna be able to show you on, uh, Microsoft still makes them, on a different make of Android camera. What I suggest you do is go online, just Google very simply, download the manual for your particular camera. It'll take you right to it go to the manual, download the manual and do a search and just put, I mean, I can do it, but I don't want to take up time and show you in two seconds. Google it. I go also there. just, yep. Go ahead. And, and in some simple, I mean, some basic tips, I just looked for settings on my phone uh, and was able to find, because uh, on an Android here and was able to find something to display grid lines. So you can probably dig through the settings and look for something that says grid lines to be able to find that too, to get the thirds. So that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, it's, it's yeah. fairly easy to, to find it. Yeah. Other questions. Like, so other questions. Um, there was also a question about how to get the dots move up and down. Um, that's beside the box. So I think it was when you were showing, because when you talk about it, maybe you could just show your phone again. Uh, it was about changing the focal point and the, and, and, and what gets the, you know, where your light settings, I think are being set. What I was just doing that. What you were now. doing. Exactly. How you were using your finger just to literally tap on the screen and, and tap on the different. Parts. That's, that's all I was doing. I was yeah. turning on my phone, tap on the screen. That's it. Yeah. And I think in all Android phones, and I know of course in the iPhone, 
uh, that it'll work. All you have to do is just turn it on, go to photo and tap on the screen and you'll see the boxes. Now you may have, I've seen this on and some Android phones that you can separate the circle and the square. Find out, it's very easy, which is which, uh, whether that's the focus or whether it's the, um, the exposure, you'll see something turn light and dark if it's the circle or the same thing with the square. But those are the two elements there that of the camera that you can um, use right away. The final question was a, a, just a general one about if you have any preferences. Since we're talking about using iPhones versus Androids, if somebody doesn't have one, if you would steer them one way or the other, and what you would look for if you're buying a phone for the camera features. Personally, poisonally, <laughs> I have, I have, uh, I have an I uh, top of the uh, line. I have an iPhone. Why? Because I teach with the knife. I, I do this. A um, good friend of mine has an LG 4 that's one half the price. That's just a marvelous phone. Um, if you don't have an Apple system, um, I would think that you could get a very, very good smartphone for three to four hundred dollars. Very good, very good. The top line is now an eleven $1 hundred dollar phone. It's either from Samsung or from uh, Apple. And what you're, <clears throat> what you're paying for is multiple lenses. The Apple and the Samsung both have three lenses. Your $300 phone will only have one lens. And if you want to enlarge, you've got to you know, move your fingers along on your screen. But what's going to happen is you're going to get grain. You're going to get a lot of grain there because you don't have three different lenses. Excuse me. Any others? Um, so yes, there's some people putting in uh, out love for the Google Pixels. People really love those. Um, and there's questions if there's any phones you would avoid. And then we'll circle around. There's another technical question about how you do something. So it sounds like you would avoid things that you can't afford. That's always a good idea. Um, get, uh, and be realistic. I mean, any phone that we get is going to be better than you know what we were shooting with 10 years ago. Um, even down to the, uh, there are some China, there are some Chinese, there are some phones that you can get for $150. Very simply go out, go to micro center, go to wherever they're selling these, go into T-Mobile or any place, take a picture and, um, send it to yourself and mail it to yourself. And you'll see, I haven't seen, uh, any really bad, bad phones anymore. They're extraordinary. Uh, the, the video capabilities of three, $400 phones are the equivalent of what used to be video movie cameras 10 years ago, five years ago. Great. So the right. technical question was when you were showing the iPhone, and I'm sorry, I, I think I was looking at questions when you were doing it. Uh, somebody says that they saw a yellow box and that you were making that yellow box bigger and smaller. What um, I was doing was there was a little sun a little bitty yellow dot. And I was moving that up and down because that changed the exposure. It changed the brightness. You don't have that necessarily um, on different Android phones. That is particular to Apple's uh, photo app. And so the more recent photo that. app too. I don't think all Apples even have that. No, so. they don't. They don't. Okay. And if you have an Apple on i6, which is, uh, they're down now to $350. They're very good. I don't think you'll have the full capabilities, although they do use the same software. Okay. So let me roll on with some of the, 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 the rules of composition, but then I've got to show you. I think that's obviously the best thing to do. And if people have additional questions, <laughs> they can ask and I'll just keep track of questions right. and we can return and do some more questions later. Thanks, Ron. So you know, another, another ca characteristic is balance, whatever that is. You're trying to have balance from one side of the picture to the other. I'll show you this. Leading lines, uh, patterns, and symmetry. I'm going to show you an entire set of photographs that just um, illustrate what we mean by, by patterns and symmetry. Uh, symmetry. 
framing the subject, cropping the subject. That's one of the first things that you can do is get everything that isn't germane, that isn't relative to your picture, to your intention, get it out. You can do that at the beginning by zooming in or the best way that all photographers used to work before zoom lenses, get close. Your feet are your zoom lens. If you're going to take a picture of a pet, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a just, there we go. Um, or you want to take a portrait of somebody, move closer and that'll do it. And try to get out of the frame all the elements that do not lend to your intention. What is your intention? What is it that you, that you want to bring there? Do you have a story? You can start that way too. And what you want to do is frame the subject, crop the subject, and try to create a focus. And I think from here on in, I'm going to just try to show you each one of these elements. There were some other um, terms that I had used last time that all lend themselves to a good composition. And as I go through this, if you have questions, for example, what is brilliance? What is contrast? How do you achieve that? I think the best thing to do is to go through it, try to show this to you, and then show you what particular um, controls of your camera you need to use to achieve these. There was one other question that came up that I think is important for this because I'm going to use it. And that is again, HDR photography, which is high dynamic range, which is going to mean, and I'll show you this, a very high level of contrast so that there are differences in the photograph of color, of brilliance, but there's detail all the way through the photograph. What your camera will do when you set it to HDR is take anywhere from three to seven photographs. I mean, bang, bang, bang. It'll take a, a picture of each one of the brightness elements, put them all together so that every part of your picture is in correct exposure. Now, I'm gonna go from here. It'll take me a minute. And I wanna bring up some of these examples for you. So we will go here and I will go to screen share and we will go up, here we go. Okay. All right, now you can see my screen, yes? Yes, we see your screen on. Okay. This is an example of the rule, the rule of thirds and what that means. If you can think of it that your, your screen is divided into a grid and that the key points are where that grid and the lines intersect. Again, I can't tell you exactly what it is the way the brain works, but if you put something in the exact center of a picture, the brain isn't sure which, where to, where to go. It could, does you go to the right, you go to the left, you say in the center. You can experiment with this by putting a grid on your screen. That is the, the rule of th thirds. I won't get into the golden ratio because I never understood it. Um, leading lines, this is a very good example of what composition people talk of leading lines, where there is something in the picture or a line or some part of the elements that lead you to the focal point of your image of what you want to lead to, which is obvious in this case, the woman's face. Diagonals are another part of a picture that you can have, I'll show you this. But again, using diagonal lines to lead the eye to the center of your attention. That's, that's the key is what is the center of your attention? What do you intend to do with the photograph? Why did you take the photograph? Um, what, what is the reason? It must exist for a reason. It can be a throwaway image, a family snapshot, or just a work of art, but what is the vision? What is the purpose of it? 
And these are some of the elements uh, that go back hundreds of years of, of what to use. This is another technique to use. It's called the frame within a frame. And this uh, works because it gives a boundary to your image. Now, sometimes you can do this merely with some trees or putting somebody between two elements or even in a doorway will work. Um, a little clue to make your pictures better immediately is first of all, I've said this before, stop your subjects from smiling. Um, it's, it's almost, you'll almost never see a quote, good portrait by a good portrait, one that's sold, one that's taken of people, or even if you go to a very good photographer to have pictures taken, it's rare that you're going to have someone smiling. Avoid sunlight if you can, and the best way to immediately start to take really good portraits is to use incident light. Take your subject and put them in a window with incident light, not sunlight falling on them. You're going to see an immediate uh, change uh, to the better in your in your portraits. Another what do you mean is by to, incident light, Ron. I'm sorry, but what uh, does that by mean? incident light, I mean not direct sunlight. Um, usually, wind uh, sun, light that's coming through a window that isn't direct. And this is called sometimes figure to ground, but this is the most popular element these days in, in the taking of photographs. And it's this area right here that they've improved the, I, the uh, smartphone cameras the most. It's right here. And what you're doing is you're getting your, your subject matter and you're getting in close and you're throwing the background out of focus. And this is very difficult to do if you don't have direct control over the aperture. If you open your lens up all the way, your depth of field is reduced so that when you focus on the person's face, the picture is out of focus and does not take away your attention. Most of the cameras these days, when you go to the portrait setting, are automatically going to try to throw that background out of focus. There's a Japanese term called bokeh, I think it's spelled B-O-K-E-H, but that's what it means. That everything except the element of focus is going to be blurred. And you can see how effective that is. The closer you get, the more the area that isn't in focus will be blurred. So if you're going to take a picture of somebody or of something, get as close, fill the frame. By filling the frame, you're not going to all, only have the attention of the person's face, but you're also going to take away the elements of the frame that don't lend anything to the picture. If that background is supposed to lend anything, I'll show you that. If it's supposed to lend something, then you can keep it. How do you keep it? Take it off of portrait and get back a little bit. Again, this is seems like common sense, but it works well, is to fill your frame with the subject matter. And here again, by filling the frame and coming closer to the subject, the building behind it, which is made up of geometric objects that could be very, very distracting, is even in, in sunlight, even in, in high light, thrown out enough to make your su subject matter stand out from the background. Um, I'm not sure about this, but again, uh, they, some, some, some rules of composition are if there's a dominant eye, uh, place that dominant eye in the center of the photograph. Again, she's not smiling. I have to say that. This is probably one of the more difficult things to do. And I'll show you how effective this can be. And that is to look for patterns. Everywhere in your photograph, look for some kind of a pattern there that um, either repeats or lends itself to either a background or sometimes even to the foreground and repetition within the, within the frame. 
And then what we call symmetry and asymmetry. I'm not sure if you can do this that easily uh, consciously or not, but there is such a thing as symmetry and asymmetry. Sometimes it's just something very simple. Um, an example, you're going to take a picture of uh, a dish of food. If you get down close enough, you're going to have the forms of the food itself which won't be falling into a background of tables and silverware and napkins, and it will be in itself pleasing because there is a certain symmetry very often to pieces of fruit, uh, to food, to a prepared meal. And these are some, some here of the examples of, and I'm going to stop the share now, um, of some of the rules of composition. Uh, are there questions right now um, about any of those rules before we get on and show you a group of other photographs that I hope will illustrate this? I, I'm certainly monitoring and watching for questions. The uh, only recent question was if there may be some possibility uh, to share pictures with each other and have you comment on them. And uh, so you and I talked about that ahead of time and we still need to figure out, um, I think in the next week we'll be ironing out exactly how we're gonna do that so we can do that in the fourth and final session, so. Um, yes, I didn't wanna do that at the beginning because we're trying to keep these sessions somewhat open so right. that if someone hasn't been in a session, but I think that we can do that anyway in the next class and just have people take pictures and we'll use them as genetics. Here are student pictures. Let's, let's do some critique of them uh, with either what we know or just from the way we feel about them and why they, why they uh, set up like that. Great. The one All question right. did come in. Uh, somebody was asking for a definition of negative space. And I can't remember which of those rules you talked about negative space, but obviously you can do a lot playing with it. So um, why don't you explain what the concept is and then what you think about its, its use. Uh, in composition. Uh, Would you like me to take a stab at, at explaining? Yeah, why that? don't you take a stab? I'm, I'm, go ahead. Okay. When I think of negative space, my, my like the first image that comes to my mind is the classic um, where it's just, you know, those black and white diagrams. I could find one and probably share it where you look at it and you see either a vase or you see two faces looking at each other. Yeah, that's, that's the uh, definition. That's the classic. So if you look at, you know, the white is the two faces looking at each other and the black in the center is the vase. And so you can see, it depends on what, what focus your, your eye takes. Um, I can look and see if I can find an example to share. You probably could too, Ron. Yeah, I'm doing, um, I, I can do it right now. In fact, um, yeah. let me just show you right now. But that's really classic. And then there's, Lots of ways you can play. So, yeah. like with, with framing, there's obviously you know that that space in the frame. The, can you see that space there? Yep, absolutely. Okay. So I would I would say this about negative space also. It's contrast. Very often you can have negative space. It doesn't have to necessarily be black and white. You can. Um, it's it's not a great term to use because it isn't neutral. It's not necessarily negative, but uh, it gives you a sense of contrast, I think. All right, other, other questions? Sometimes negative space can kind of, uh, or the, the use of, sometimes it surprises you. So sometimes it's hard to see in the moment, I think. Uh, it's only after looking at pictures later that you notice, you know, it, 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 sometimes I find it, at least personally, it's, it's hard to, set something up. Whereas sometimes later, if you're looking for patterns, if you just switch your perspective, you can see things that, well, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah. Now let's, let's um, try to share a screen. And I've collected a group of pictures that I hope will start to illustrate. You can see that. I can't, uh, it's, it's this picture is showing right now. Yep, we see that picture, the, the couple on the beach. Right. Yep. I wanted to give you a, an example of where, where um, with this term where H, HDR really is um, 
is uh, the high dynamic range of how to use it and how, how it can work. This is a photograph as the sun is going down um, over Boston in the background. The sun itself is coming through the trees and there's a couple sitting here and you can see that actually the, uh, that the sun was, um, was actually uh, reflecting off of my iPhone from the lens because on the woman's hair, you see that little octagon there? That very often indicates that you're taking a picture into the sun, which is a rule that you should never, you know, that, that's, that's a rule you shouldn't break, you can break it. If you set your camera on high dynamic range, you'll find it, HDR. What it did was it took a photograph of the sun. So it focused on the sunlight. It brought down the brightness so that you can almost see the detail behind it. And then it took a photograph of the water. And then it took a picture of the trees. And then it took a picture of the couples. Each time the camera took a picture, it exposed and focused that element, quote, correctly. If you take a look at that tree over on the right-hand side, you can actually see detail in the bark because the camera went out on its own when you set it for HDR and took a picture of that also and exposed it correctly. You might say, well, how come? How can it put the thing together and not have it out of focus and jittery because you can never hold the thing steady for five exposures. That's the beauty of the computer. That's what the, the software and the Apple and the iPhone and now almost all phones can do. And then again, you can see all of the detail there in the grass. There is one problem with this. I don't know if anyone's noticing it. It's unnatural. This is reality. But nothing is reality in art anyway. I mean, every lens that you choose changes the perspective of, of the picture. Um, you can make somebody look bad by just waiting until they grimace. So this is, but what happens with HDR, if you keep it set for too long, you're going to start to get a, a rather unnatural perspective, uh, vision from your pictures. So I would be a little careful of it but it's, it's marvelous for what you can do. Um, now, other elements of photography. If you're going to take a picture of a plant or a flower, what you wanna do is first ask yourself, what's, what's the center of my attention? What am I trying to do here? And what you're trying to do here is to expose the bright areas for the elements that you want to, uh, how shall I focus on? Th this is the purpose of it. Notice in the top right hand corner, anything that isn't in that sunlight is going to go out to dark. It gives you contrast. And the form of this bush um, is what becomes the center of attention. Again, you fill your frame. So there are very few elements within something like this that detract from your attention. Again, sometimes you may not want anything but just form. This is a photograph taken of in a swimming pool. And if you see these different elements and there, there's a balance here, also that line that goes through the picture, it's very nice to be able to take a photograph and then describe it later because it could be accidental. But that line that goes through it from the pole draws your eye right through there. The contrast of the yellow at the top gives you, um, again, I wouldn't say negative space, but a balance to the reflection of the umbrella in the water and the yellow there at the top. These are some of the elements of composition. I wanna show you another very good example of how to use high dynamic range. This is a photograph taken as the sun is, is down, it's gone down. So it's very, very dark in the foreground and it's still quite bright at the top. And what you can see is that there's, there's uh, definition and 
detail in almost all the different parts of this photograph. Again, the use of line draws your eye in, gives you a sense of balance in the foreground, and even the uh, vertical poles, as opposed to the horizontal lines, gives you a sense of balance. These are composition. This one, I think, is, I, I put this in for one reason as an example of how good these cameras are and how good what you can do with your smartphone. This photograph was taken at night through the window of, uh, of, of a, I think of Lincoln Center out into the street. And what's absolutely incredible is that these cameras can actually pick up detail almost everywhere in this image. I think you can almost see people down there in the bottom right-hand corner in a window. And believe it or not, I don't think you could get something like this with a $1,500, $2,500, uh, $30,000 with, with, with any other kind of camera. It's absolutely astounding what the computer can do. And you should use your camera more and more in situations that you don't think anything is going to come out. And this was not that manipulated either. It was astounding. Again. Ron, there's a question. Uh, yeah, somebody yeah. was looking at their HDR settings and they're seeing on, off, and enhanced. Ah, um, so you really? covered HDR, but and I, and I did a quick search and I found there's like HDR plus versus HDR enhanced. And there's a whole like- Where is, where is this? Uh, this is a, I found it on Reddit um, where it was, HDR uh, versus HDR plus enhanced. And, uh, and, and what they I mean, were saying be, there was it was about moving subjects and how HDR plus was better um, if you had, let's see, it says if you if the subject stands still and you have all the time in the world, that's a good time to use the enhanced. But if you just have a moving subject like a, something, uh, then that's when you use HDR plus. So I think this may be with well, Google yeah. Pixels. I have, I have not heard of it. But I would always love to have anything that's enhanced. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. A shirt, an enhanced shirt. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I'm sure that somehow they've tweaked the computer so that it will take the elements of the picture and give you even more contrast. Well, I mean, something like this. This is a, this is a still, okay? And I set, this was set at, again, at HDR. And you can see again the range of detail and light that you can start to get. If this was taken with a regular camera without a computer in it, without HDR, um, you would have lost detail either in the sky or the foreground would have been completely black. I don't know what enhanced, uh, how much more. Maybe what it does is it gives you a greater degree of resolution by that, I mean of um, definition by sharpening the image more. Balance and just form. Balance and form. The subject matter is the man's face, really, or it can be the Campbell's head. The point is, there's a triangle there. There's the shadow on the right side. There's the the image of the camel right in the middle, and then down there at the bottom, uh, this was very fortuitous because that bright blue gives you also contrast to the brown of the background. This is part of composition. I've, uh, we threw on this also a frame around it, and you can play with these. Uh, you can, I'll show you how to get different uh, framing uh, applications if you wanted to do it. But it does give you a border, a sense. And that's really why people frame their photographs if they're going to hang them on the wall. But this is a good example of composition to the point of, uh, of having a certain degree of balance and control over your, over your picture, over your, the image that you're taking. Let's see another example of, I wanted to also show that you can do with the panorama. And you can also get a sense of, of balance and exposure. You can also do HDR and combine it with panorama. That's what this is. 
So the high definition resolution gives you detail in the foreground and the clouds stand out and are washed out. Leading lines. The main subject, which is either the violin or that, that smile, I wouldn't call that a smile, um, that face um, is placed where we would say is the rule of thirds. There are elements behind which are, in this case, architectural. And the case leads your eye right, direct, right up to the main subject matter. Uh, we're not interested in the money that's in the case. We're interested in the person sitting on the street. But the case is a part of this picture and gives you a certain degree, a, a sense of the entity of the whole uh, photograph itself. This is a wonderful example. That's a photograph of a town in Mexico taken from a hill. And all the, 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 the basic aesthetic uh, sense of this is the geometric form and all of those colors and contrasts that lend itself to something that goes beyond just showing you a group of buildings. And that again is part of your framing and it's part of looking for form. Um, again, an example of how much better a photograph often is with natural light falling on the subject so that it doesn't get washed out. You have a neutral background that's almost out of focus in the top left. And the person is not even looking into the camera. And it gives you what you would call eventually some kind of portrait, try it. Take somebody and turn their face to the side, put them in a window, and people are going to start to see, well, that's a, that's a real portrait. And it works also by not using absolute sunlight, direct light, it, it gives a softness to skin, to skin color. Um, again, the use of what we call um, uh, definition is an example here, whereby having absolutely everything in as great, as fine a focus as you could do. There's a lot of elements in this picture. First of all, the background is not, this is not HDR. So I let, you let the background go out so it's darker and doesn't detract. The bird's uh, head incidentally happens to be at one of those intersecting lines, but you don't do this consciously after a while. And the color and the definition gives you, uh, again, a sense of where the subject is. And do you, if you notice something else about it, I don't know how this worked, but the water is running beneath it. And because of the use of a very, very slow shutter speed, all the definition that would have come from the water and the sparkling water is um, used as a softened background because of with a slow shutter speed, you're gonna get the sense of the, the water moving. So these, these again are elements of composition. This is a straight example of composition. Um, where you have here vertical lines, different colors, you have contrast between the brights and the whites and the dark at the top. And these elements, hopefully in good composition, will, will come together and give you something that somewhere in your own mind um, makes you think of, uh, of, of something that is not just a snapshot. Um, this is one other very good example, I want to keep using these, of HDR. And the way that you'll do this is when you go to take a picture, a photograph, when you're traveling, one of the rules of thumb always is the best time to, to take photographs, and it really is, is an hour before sunrise and an hour after sunrise. But sunrise and sunset are going to give you extraordinary definition within the picture because the light is coming from the side. The problem can be that you're going to have excessive shadow 
And unless you want to show that shadow, then you can use this, this HDR uh, to bring out detail and color in all of the different parts of the photograph. Um, there's an idea, that's another part of composition, is that, um, that uh, it's the ability of the photographer to communicate with the, let's see there, with the viewer, to tell a story through the composition. Um, the lighting, it all works to this, but every, every photo exists for a reason. So every element within that picture, that's composition, and there's a vision behind it. So there's a story here. There's a, the, obviously the, the object of the story is the man who is standing at the phone booth. But there are elements in that photograph, the, the horizontal lines, and then including that painting of the woman who is, if you look at her, she's got her back to him and she's looking at something. And it gives you a, a certain sense of, uh, of aloneness, of loneliness. There's a vision within that photograph. You might have to stop and wait for a long time to get this, but if you're thinking of that, you might be able to do that kind of a thing. And again, having something lead into the picture, that always does it. So, so that, uh, so, so that there's an element that leads you immediately into the photograph. Let me stop there for a minute or two and see what questions or comments you might have. I'd certainly encourage folks to ask questions. There's been a couple that have come through. Uh, one person was wondering, uh, how you would achieve a slow shutter speed on a phone? That um, is a very, very good question. And maybe we, we should, before we even get into that, for people who don't know why you'd want to do that, maybe you could, maybe, maybe you could even find an example good, 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 or show good. people what it looks like, and then we can talk about how to do it. Um, a slow shutter speed is going to give you a sense of motion that you intend. If you use a slow shutter speed and your subject moves, they're going to be blurred. If you want them to be blurred, you use a slow shutter speed. Or if you want to take a picture in very low light, you've got to get your camera up on a tripod so it's steady, get it down to an eighth of a second. Now you're asking, how do you do this? That's next week. Um, the way that you do this is that there are applications that you can either buy or are free, and I'll show you these, that allow you to manually control your smartphone the same way you used to be able to control your film camera 15 years ago. And what it allows you to do is to set the camera manually so that you can then have a slower shutter speed, wider aperture, and control, have even much greater control. I used a slow shutter speed with the picture of the bird because I wanted the, the water to be flowing. Now, the next question comes, how can you hold an iPhone or, or a smartphone so that it doesn't shake? It's got built into it a little gyroscope. And those little gyroscopes, uh, I forget what they're called, um, you can turn it on or off. Uh, it's, it's, it, prevents, it prevents shake. What it does is it allows you to handhold your camera now to speeds that you could never ever achieve before. I mean, down to sometimes as slow as a half a second to almost a second. And that little gyroscope inside is going to keep the lens, believe it or not, or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the image plane vibrating and moving counter to the motion of the shake of your hand. And there's a setting on your camera um, that will in some cameras allow you to do this. It should be almost automatic. When you get your iPhone, it's set to, to do this. I remember finding, and I haven't used it recently, but a really cool setting on an iPhone where with an image that you did, you, you captured as a live photograph, you could swipe up and yeah. things that were moving um, in the live photograph, you could actually apply different effects to. And I had great uh, um, luck using that on a waterfall 
um, where I, you know, would swipe up and you could do loops, you could do all sorts of things with the animation, or you could just blur it and get this great, you know, kind of soft water feel, which is something that you get with a, a long exposure otherwise. Um, and they did it just by taking, you know, that live video and compressing it. And that was a really kind of cool trick yeah. too. Yeah. Um, other other uh, other questions before we go and try to uh, show some of the other elements of of composition here. So the other question was just a, a comment about the sign. There was no parking sign in the last shot of the man who was on the phone yes. with the, the painting of it, and uh, I think just calling out. I mean, that was a very interesting textural element. I didn't know if you had any additional thoughts about it. Yeah, no, I did. I, I wanted it in there because it shows somebody in a little wheelchair and, and uh, it, it, your eye gets drawn to that. Uh, it's sort of, uh, obviously this is not a picture of a happy man calling home somehow. That was the intention of the photograph to begin with. And having a uh, picture of a, of a diagram of a wheelchair I thought would be part of the element of the idea of the picture. And apparently there was a no parking sign as well, which would drive yeah. that home too. It's like, yeah. you, you can make a call, but you can't stay here. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. All right, we will well, go people on. are enjoying it. Let's continue. Let's look at some Let's more continue. pictures. I wanna, I wanna do now, and one of the elements of composition that's always brought up is, do you have a theme? Um, do you have an idea? Do you have one central idea when you go out with your camera? What do you want to do today? What do you want to take pictures of? What do you want to, do you want to sit there in Boston Common and just sit on a bench and take pic photographs of people going by? And um, the elements of just sometimes you don't need human subjects. You don't need a panorama, just form sometimes and design alone um, can do this. And I'll give you some, let's see, we've got to go back to uh, share the screen and let's go here and let me bring this back. And have you got it? Can you see that? Yep, the, yep uh, we see that it looks like a whole lot of rust. Absolutely. There it is. Cool. Pure design, absolute design. And try sometimes when you see something, it, it may not have any reason, but it's just the design and the repetition and the color alone that, uh, that gives us this. And one of the elements that you can use with your own camera in this particular scene, the, um, the clarity and the, and the definition if you can see every little, every little gear and the sharpness, which is again, absolutely incredible of what you can do with, with a little bitty uh, uh, smartphone. But again, just pure design. That, that's uh, um, as you're walking along a wall, again, with design and eliminating as much as you can any elements of your composition that might be detracting from it. You can do this uh, on a walk through, uh, try it sometime, just go to Boston, go to Quincy. I'll tell you something to do, I don't know where you live. Um, go, go to Boston now um, uh, and see, it. the city has changed. Uh, take a bike ride through, it's like uh, we're living in, a, in, an in an apocalypse. The stores are all boarded up now on uh, Newbury Street. And all of a sudden, you can find images that you were never able to see before, find before in a major city. I think New York is probably the same kind of thing. And it doesn't have to, this is, a, this is the hood of a car. This is the rusted hood of a car. Again, pure design, pure color, pure line. Um, graffiti, but then adding something to that graffiti, to the background. And the woman's face down in the bottom sort of fits in with the, with the elements, the rest of the picture. You may not think so, but it, it works that way. Again, just pure design, just a wall as you're walking along. 
you get closer, you'll eliminate most of the elements that don't add to it. And this, whoever who took this has no idea what's up there in the dark area on the top because the exposure is, is uh, thrown out and the white in the top left doesn't detract from it. Again, just walking along streets sometimes uh, in a city and the different colors of the buildings and the graffiti alone sometimes are, are, uh, are worth the, uh, the look. This was really fun. I don't know how many of you saw this when it was in Boston um, on the, uh, what's it called? The Greenwood in the middle of the city when they took down the highway, the... Uh, that's the Rose, the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Yeah, yeah. And I forget the artist's name. She's wonderful. And she put up this wonderful uh, set of uh, almost parachute cloth across the green. And the art itself was reflecting in one of the tall buildings that line the green. And there was the composition uh, within that. Again, it uses probably four or five of the different rules of composition. Doesn't necessarily have to use them, but it, 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 it does with the, uh, the diagonals, with the, comp with the contrast and the colors. And these are just examples of what you can do. And the other thing is also, is just simplify. Just get close to something that would never be a picture, never be a composition. It's, you're walking along the street, Take your iPhone and just aim it at the, at the, at the uh, sidewalk. You'll be amazed at what you can get, especially the closer you get. Um, here's another example. This is the uh, derailleur of a bicycle on a street. By coming in close on it, you eliminate what's distracting and just concentrate on the pure form itself. Again, getting close. Your iPhone has the ability to take almost macro photographs. By that, I mean close up, you don't have to do anything. And um, if you're not close enough and you have a phone with two lenses, move to the, um, to the tel telephoto lens. Again, um, this, is, this is an example of what you can take from the mundane and make into something that has form, it has texture. That's a, uh, a woman sitting on a chair um, in, in, in a boat. That's her, sh I don't know if you can even see what it is. That's her shoulder, that's her bathing suit, that's the red bathing suit. And the yellow is the covering of the jacket. You've taken if you, what would have been a mundane subject and looked purely at the foam whatever the form is, and using color to show that kind of contrast in the form itself. Um, indoors in a, in, a, in, a, in a concert hall, just putting together the forms alone, simplicity. In this case, there's a real balance there. I don't know if it was consciously done, but you can see from the larger elements in the top down to the screen, so they sort of lead down there, even though it's very small to the piano. Um, this one, this one is a good illustration. Just walking along the street. That's a, the rear, that's the real light of, of an automobile. And there's an, an aesthetic uh, sense of composition in a lot of the world that you may not be aware of. And this is one way of one way of doing that. Again, uh, a uh, a reflection in a in a in a mirror. So these are the cases of uh, the ways. Again, this was just in a puddle. There was some oil in it, and this is what you can do. It has no meaning in itself. It's not a picture of anyone. It's not a photograph of some place that you've visited. And again, the more and more that you can do of just pure form, um, that's actually 
the, the gearings of a clock in Cambridge and it still works. Um, and uh, the form of it, the color was, was incredible. So let me stop there and let me see if there are questions for there for composition that I hope illustrated. I'm not seeing any questions come through, but I'm wondering how much of those photos uh, that you were just looking at, were those the original? Were they, I mean, you can do so much with cropping um, and taking something that you've photographed and, and changing even in some ways the composition by what you choose to take out um, after the effect. There's the Photoshop cheat. <laughs> there's, there's what we'll get to hopefully uh, next time and the time after is post-production. And it's not, you know, people used to say it's cheating. Um, you can't tell if the photograph is real or it isn't real. It, it's never real. A painting is never, is never real. You're using paint. I mean, paint isn't real, isn't, my, isn't somebody's face. And a lot of, you've got to start with a good picture. I mean, let's face it, you couldn't start with that head, with that rear, rear light, you know, the headlight, if the form wasn't there to begin with. If the color wasn't there so that you could intensify it, you're not going to get it. So you've got to start with something that um, has those elements. And then I hope I'll be able to show you how to use, we won't have that much time next time, but how to use these very special applications and I'll even show you how to get Photoshop for free uh, and download it to your cameras. Uh, have your cameras ready or write down what I, what I show because a lot of these, what Photoshop does, what Adobe does is wants you to get this for free so that maybe someday you'll buy one of their um, applications, but it's amazing what you can do. Yeah, a lot of this, I have to admit, I have to say is um, finagled, is, is adjusted. But again, I could, you could never get that image of that clock if you didn't have that to begin with. If you didn't go and have that angle that you're taking it at, no matter what you do, you're not going to, you're not going to get it. Um, so were those all your photographs, Ron? That you just yeah. Shared? yeah so, these, that's fabulous. Thanks. Yeah. Now, this, these were from a magazine. Um, okay. And the reason that I could use these, because they all had one sense of purpose, they wanted just one, uh, one uh, 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 set. Um, I'll give you an example now of an idea. The I have assignment... a couple other questions when you have, do yep. we have a couple other questions? A... I'll take the questions. Okay, um, one question is, it, do, is it preferable, do you prefer landscape versus portrait? How do you decide which way to hold your phone? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Um, okay, I'll show you, all right? I'll, I'll give you two examples uh, right now. I'll give you a all shot. Right. Are we Thank on you. my screen or not? No, nope, we're looking at you right now. Okay, let me, let me show you. Let me give you examples of that. Right okay, now. great. So the assignment is, if we had a whole course, the assignment is putting human beings, putting people together in museums, is to do an essay on the different, uh, different museums and trying to also get the elements of some human beings interacting or being within that, that uh, gallery. So the first thing is, let me go back up here and I got to get this back and we'll go here and let's see, I have to ask, you can see that. Yep, we see that. There, all right, there's a vertical picture. <laughs> and again, this is the interior of a museum. Um, the lines in this particular case are vertical and uh, they are the strongest lines. And it's a sense of design, not necessarily of the art that's within, that's in the museum. So there's one idea, when you go out to take a picture, you're gonna go take a walk in the woods. You wanna be able to take the designs in tree trunks. Um, you wanna just focus that, that day on cat of nine tails and that's all you do. 
and you have an idea and there's another, there's people sitting there above uh, a painting and they're part of the picture. Again, this was horizontal. So there's a theme here, there's an idea there. And again, I wanted to use these just to show you something, these are smaller. The capabilities of your camera are, of your iPhone, of your phone are extraordinary. The phone itself is capable of giving you straight detail, both in the highlights and sometimes also in the background of inside a museum. This is another example of composition of the rule of thirds, I suppose you'd say, and of the, the, uh, vert you know, the elements leading to each other. And there it is there in a larger respect. And the people are interacting with it because there was a show going on of people dancing at the same time. Um, and there they are. So this was a museum exhibit, but there were people actually, um, this was a video uh, that was taken as it was going on. There's another example. As you're going, one of the beauties of the, uh, of the uh, smartphone is you can now take candid photography that nobody used to be able to do without having a special case and sitting in a subway with a camera in your lap or using a reflex camera and taking pictures of them without knowing that you're taking them. These days, you don't, nobody knows you're taking the picture because you could be just looking at your camera. I mean, excuse me, at your phone. You just hold your phone up and talk into it while you're taking the picture. And again, I felt that these, these elements went together. Uh, that I showed you. Again, sometimes there are just elements that are geometric and you can place them at different parts. Again, there's the rule of thirds. Um, the background and the foreground are in focus and there's nothing there. You wait until people leave. Um, graffiti in an alley, uh, graffiti on a, on a building and move around and try to get all of the different parts of the other parts of the building together so that it says something. This I wanted to use to show you the total, the capability of the smartphone to capture detail in low light. And I think that you could probably use this. Now, the question came up that Clayton asked too, I've sharpened this in post-production. And I've sharpened it enough so that it doesn't deteriorate from it, but it brings out all of the different elements. But you can do this inside a building. You can do this in a bar. This was taken in, in a bar. The lights coming in from the right-hand side and the light there is also, uh, the detail is gone, but all of the elements of the shade come through. This is another example. I wanted to put a person in there. So there's the person at the top interacting with his own clothing, but there's an element of the, the, the subject themselves interacting within the mannequins. And then on the right side, the same, this. Those two people, that's the intention. Those two people, they're, they're the focal point right there. And the contrast using black and white, um, I think works to this, the empty shirt on the right uh, beneath the, the picture of Elvis, it goes together to make a composition and say something about those two people. They're tourists, they're tired, she's not happy, he doesn't care. This was very, very fortuitous. This is the uh, Martin Luther King uh, uh, Museum in, where is this? I forget right now, uh, not Atlanta. Um, it'll come to me. Is that in this Birmingham? Is, or? Yeah, yeah. And there's one kid sitting there at this counter of mannequins. And he's the only live person there but there's something about placing that live person within that picture. This was the theme. This was what it was supposed to do. And that was the intention of putting a live person in there to be part of that context. Again, people in a museum, 
all these people, the paintings in the background. Um, Ron, somebody this, asked a question as you're showing yeah. these pictures of people. Um, and this is a great place to pause it. They're obviously fascinating. Like I loved that picture of the, the couple with Elvis. Like everybody was looking at the phone. It was fabulous. Um, what about privacy? Do you ask permission of people when you take their photograph? Do you take their picture and show if, it afterwards? This is a, you just this, steal their image? It's a very good question. The law is that anybody who is in a public space is fair game. You don't have to get their, you don't have to get their, uh, 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 what's it called, model release. On the other hand, if you're going to be selling that photograph and it has commercial use, most, I'm not, a, I'm, when I say a professional photographer, I'm not making a living at this. So for me, it's not important that I get a model release because it may be end up in a gallery but it'll be changed enough, but it's not for, for publication necessarily. If you're really going to do this for a living is then carry model releases, go up to the people, say, I've taken your picture, get their email address, tell them that you'll send them a photograph. And most of the time they, they'll go along with it. When you're traveling, absolutely ask. Um, and if someone sees you taking a picture of them, back off. The other answer is use a big telephoto lens. But yes, model release all the time. Okay, thanks. Another question, um, which definitely relates to this question and to this picture here and a couple others, and um, but it's also related to the picture that you had um, of, of the machine earlier and you talked about angles. I wonder if you could say a few words about what are our ideal angles for subjects? And especially, I think, you know, oh, I think my kids, you know, tell me that, you know, the, everybody loves doing the, the top down angle and doing the selfie by holding the phone up and shooting down. It's more complimentary, um, yeah. but maybe that's, that's a tired angle too. What, what do you think? What kind of advice can you give on good I, angles I, for portraits? I, I, the, the, the best advice is move around. Before you take the picture, move around. And you'll find you're old enough to have a sense of aesthetics, not only of your own sense of aesthetics, but you've seen hundreds and thousands and millions of images. And by this time, you really start to get a sense of whatever that word good means. Um, and you'll get a sense of it. And it, it, if there is a sense of composition that's based upon some innate kind of aesthetic, um, you'll know that that particular point of view is what you want to do. Um, you know what the geometric forms are. If it fits one of the geometric forms, this is a, this is a, a pyramid. This is a triangle. But look for circles and you'll find those elements within the photograph. Um, this was very fortuitous. That is a painting. I can't remember the artist's name, but uh, I think that he was sued recently for not treating his models well. Let's put it that way. And these are three people looking, I, I'll remember his name in a minute. Um, this is the painting of him. And these are people standing in front of it, blocking it, but interacting with it so that it becomes another, another image. It, it becomes an image with, with human beings looking at the, at the painting. And sometimes black and white, you can fool around and change it to that. Again, pure, Composition. That's the only way I could. This is taken in the ICA. And there's one place in Boston in the, um, in the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. And it just, the different elements, the, the horizontals, the verticals, the different colors that contrast, go to make up what eventually, uh, I suppose, defines a certain kind of composition. Um, again, Simplification. Um, people within 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 a photo within a picture. Um, there's no people there. This one. This was. I can't recall how this came about. It was in a museum, and somehow or other there was a blue background, and there were people walking around in front of it, and the contrast and just the form of the people, and uh, the person on the right looking sort of into the picture gives it a very powerful effect of actual live people within that. 
this one, this one, I, who knows how you, I mean, just every face, none of them are looking at the camera. So nobody is, is particularly aware that somebody is taking their photograph at all. Um, it just worked. How does it work? Um, I think three of them have canes, have vertical canes that they're using. None of them are looking in, one's looking one way, another's looking another way, and they're sitting in a museum um, resting. And uh, it, it gives you, a, there's, there's a theme to it, there's an idea to this. Again, the kid, the kid's face, um, that's what you find. That's what you may, may be fortunate enough to, to you know, wait around. Um, or just pure, pure form. When you go into a museum, this is probably this is the uh, coat coat racks. Now you got to you got to go in and pull the coats off. Now you go into a, in a into a room that doesn't have any coats hanging on it. Um, again, geometric form, composition, not the paintings. And how do you get this? You move around until the windows happen to line up like that within these squares. Again, the MFA downstairs, looking down in the MFA at the tables in the large atrium. This is real. Um, this was taken in the uh, museum in Portland, Maine. Um, got two names, it'll come to me in a, in a moment. And there was a ballerina, there was a woman up on a catwalk and she was part of the museum, but she was just practicing her ballet. And the silhouette is much more powerful than I think because it's a form than details there of her face. Um, again, this kind of just form within a museum piece. And the count, you, 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 this is again, the reflections. Um, so this, as I say, all had some kind of sense of form. Again, um, a car museum. Get up close, wait for the light to be right, look for the elements, look for the texture. Um, this was just pure luck. Uh, you had to be there. But again, there's an idea here somewhere. And uh, this, this is marvelous. It's a, it's a mother, a grandmother, and a child going down the steps, uh, probably, probably in the MFA in Boston. But the point is, is to put human beings, put people into the museum itself, eliminate what, what doesn't belong there, and the lines will take you to the subject matter, to the main subject. There's that run that last one. How is that framed? That was very different framing than that. It almost looks like it was a picture on a glass. But yeah, was it, was, I'll, I'll show it. Was that a post effect? Um, it's it's a oh yeah, all of these frames post, are post yeah. effects. Okay. And believe me, the the publisher didn't like them, and I just didn't have time to get rid of them for this. <laughs> But uh, you can play around with frames and, and you go wild with them. And uh, they, I, they felt it detracted, I agree now. Hmm. Ron, I have a, a question. As you're going about, this is fabulous. And I think we could all spend all night watching and, and looking and, and, and having commentary on your pictures. Um, how, do you do, how would you suggest people uh, who really wanna practice you know, applying one of these themes, do you, you know, do you just go and try to do it in every picture or do you go out and say, no, okay, I'll today I'm going to do this. So today okay. I'm going to do, yeah. How do you go about developing go, go, to, go to a museum, oh. go to a museum. And instead of just concentrating and looking at the, at the painting, so the pictures, look at the other elements that are there that in and of themselves have a sense of balance, of aesthetics. Here's, this is a, a good example. That is a corner in a museum with a wastebasket. And it just comes together. It just gives you a sense of the composition that um, you may not even know is going to be there. But if you wander around and look in the hallways, go to the bathrooms. They're always great. Um, you're best off when there's no one in there. 
I but, do not recommend taking pictures of people <laughs> without their permission in bathrooms. That's a way to get in a lot of but trouble. But again, the <laughs> silver, the 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 just look, just look for composition. Just look for painting. Uh, look for paintbrushes. Go in and find out where people. Here you go. This is this is uh, in uh, one of the museums, and it's the children's room. And there's just for there's a mother and a daughter in the museum in a little children's workroom. And that's not what you would have gone there to see. Um, again, so all a question, this, Ron, were all these photos that we were looking at, these were all taken with your phone? Um, most of these, a lot of them were taken with the phone. Yeah. And since I'm illustrating composition right now, I didn't have all of them with the phone, but most of them. Um, I know I can find, I know, I know that uh, most of them were. This one here is the interior of a cockpit in an airplane museum. Um, and it, it really transforms it. Again, uh, in a B and Airbnb, there's the other one I wanted. That's in a museum recently. That's just sitting there. Uh, in a hallway um, in, I don't, I forget which museum, but um, there it is. And the, oh, and the, the, the most foot to it is, they were cleaning the floors and, and, and a, uh, at one of the uh, installations at the MFA. This was taken with that. That's a, that's a real person. That's not part of the painting. All right, let me stop. Um, I wanted to show again the interactions of the people in the museum looking at the paintings. And if you wait long enough, you're going to see in every gallery people, people looking at the paintings, interacting with the paintings. Um, there's another gallery picture. All right. If there are questions, I've been trying to, I'm using, you know, what I, what I have here too, um, to illustrate the different uh, elements of composition. And uh, we still have a few, we have some minutes. I want to uh, show you where to go to get uh, some very, very good uh, examples on your own. But let me stop here for questions. So I think you're good, uh, unless people want to take a moment to type some questions right now. Um, there haven't been any new ones in these last couple of minutes. So I think we're good to show some people some examples. There was a comment earlier um, in which it appeared that instead of using a rule of thirds, that a picture was, was divided into fourths, uh, which kind of sparks the question, you know, Great I wonder if you... Yeah. <laughs> Are there some favorite uh, images that you can think of that do break the rules? And, and can, Almost all know. of them. You know, the rules are not, I, I don't, I think that the rules themselves grow out of the art, that the rules come after somebody builds a building and, and people like it. Uh, and then they say, let's use those techniques for the next building. And somebody makes a, a painting and someone likes this one and not another. It's the way the mind works. I'm sure there are different aesthetics and different cultures that have other rules. I'm not a painter, but I'm sure that there are other rules that you can say, that's Japanese. Well, why is it Japanese? What, you know, what, what are the characteristics of paintings that are not Western? And then they become the rules for that particular uh, type of painting. Um, but they, they help you to start. They do help. If you say to somebody, get rid of stuff that doesn't belong there, that's enough. Yeah, decluttering definitely helps. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good rule. Yeah. Other questions now? I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So let's All show right. people some examples. And then um, people are just appreciating uh, the quality of the photos and, and talk about how inspiring it is just to see. Because I think so much of appreciating a good photo is also just like, how do we look at it? And, and this conversation I found personally really rewarding. So thank you. Good, good, good. Um, let me get rid of this. I'm just going to show you 
something here that um, I want to bring up and this will help you. Um, ah, here it is, okay. Um, I'm going to now go back to the screen and show you something that you should start to do. Um, let's go here. Okay. You can see the screen that says uh, here how to shoot. Yep, we see that. Okay. One of the one of the things that you can start to do immediately is go to Google. Stick in Google, what makes a good photograph? You'll come up with five, 10, 15 different videos and examples. And one of the best that I have found is this one here. And if you can read at the top, it's an Apple video and the URL is apple.com. Put in apple.com photography. You can see that URL, apple.com slash iPhone photography. And what they have done is come up with all these different examples of how to use your camera it goes way beyond what I can do here in an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half. If you want to know how to shoot with light and shadow, there is a marvelous, marvelous uh, video that will take you through this and how to lock the focus and all the different steps as you go on. I'll go back on that. Let's see how I can get rid of that. Um, and there are all of those, now I lost, uh, I lost, uh, what was it? Uh, Apple iPhone. If you go there, that, that one um, set of videos will take you through on how to use your iPhone. And those are also uh, transferable to, the, uh, to almost any camera that you use. And these are just the subjects. How to search for photos, how to trim a video, how to shoot using the role, rule of thirds how to shoot with stage light, all of these examples of what to do if you want to know how do you shoot with a panoramic? How do you shoot a burst mode? How do you shoot in black and white? Um, all these examples are there, how to, how, to, how, how to experiment with framing. And the videos are very, very good. It takes you through, there it is, step-by-step with the image of your camera there. And I just I put a link to that in the chat. So folks want to follow that. Um, I think what, I, yeah, I'll, what I'll do too is we'll put, uh, well, I'll put some links and I didn't realize we can do all that. So um, it's well, very difficult you, to, uh, to describe sometimes what composition is, but the examples that I were giving you were assignments that I happened to have that had a particular uh, assignment and they were using these elements of composition. So it lent itself to what uh, today's lesson was. It well, was it is challenging. It's, it's you know, kind of like talking about music or, you know, these are hard things to do. You have to appreciate them. So sharing your screen and sharing, you know, and talking about it as we are looking at it together, I think is really helpful. So I encourage people to look and see, you know, maybe for the next time, um, if people want to email me uh, examples of art that they find particularly, um, you know, engaging, and maybe they don't even know why, or maybe they have something that they'd just love to hear, you know, share something that's really special to them. I'd be happy to do that because sometimes we can learn a lot just by looking at photos that we think are really striking and unique. So I'll send out an email and- uh, And what I'll I'm going to do, way. what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to show you, um, and they work, I'll only, I'll use them that work on both the Android and the iPhone on applications that you can download that are going to give you the post-production 
kinds of renditions that I've been using. I'll show you how to turn a picture into a, uh, into a watercolor that's really quite good. Great. Well, that will be fun. All right. Thank you, Ron. This has been a, a lot to think about. And I think a lot of, you know, we'll have to go and digest these ideas and go back to the beginning. We can watch this recording, think about the different rules and suggestions uh, and go and keep taking pictures. I think that's one of the best advices for any artist is to go and just keep developing your eye, just keep practicing it. So yeah. take your kids and put them in front of a, in, on, uh, next to a window. There you go. <laughs> Not in direct turn sun. To, turn them to the side. That's right. And no smiling. No smiling. No, no smiling. <laughs> I'm going to have our time. I'm getting lots, right. of, uh, lots of thanks as well from everybody who's been watching. They you know, can't tell you themselves. But Ron, I just want to say thank you for everybody who's enjoyed the program tonight. Yeah. Uh, people have really loved it. Uh, and um, it's coming in across both on here and out on YouTube. Um, there's some folks are asking what my email is. So I'll put it both on YouTube and here in the chat stream. Uh, and if people have any further questions for me, um, I'm happy to hang out for a little bit. But Ron, thank you so much for joining us. And I, I'll, I'll hang out also. No, I mean, okay. if there's any questions, I'll, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, great. So I'll just put my email here in the chat log here. Folks are welcome to go because we're just about to wrap everything up. But there is my email. It's cchiever at oclm.org. And I will also put uh, in YouTube. There we go. Great. Looks like everybody's got my email address. Ryan, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. So um, if anybody misses it in the chat, they can go and find it on the YouTube piece. They can watch this video there later. Um, they can also just go out to our website, thomascranelibrary.org. Uh, anybody you find there can, can direct, they, they can direct them to me. Uh, and if you have questions for Ron, I'm happy to forward those to Ron. Um, so uh, there was a question. Uh, people were wondering, oh, oh the, um, the, there was a question about one of the apps that you use. They're considering buying it. Uh, and the app, they were wondering, was it Filmic Pro? Do people have to tune in next week? Or do you want to, uh, do you want to? You're muted. We can't hear you. Um, I want to do them all of, of a list and, and, and show you. Um, there are so many that you, the, the one that you really, I think, need to pay for that's just got so much capability, I think is all of $5. But uh, the rest of them are free at this point. And now that they're coming out with throwing in Photoshop, uh, you, you, it's the, the, the opportunities to post for post-production are, are infinite. So I will do all those next time. Excellent. So people have an incentive to tune in as if yes. they didn't have an incentive already. This is great. And, and we get so many ideas. So thank you, Ron. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and sign everybody off uh, and end this program. But thank you for joining us, Ron. It's been great. Really enjoyed it. Now, we'll see you again next week. Yes. All Bye. right. Good night, everybody. All right.